I'm Aaron Weintraub, and this is Inside Kurdistan. In 2014, when ISIS was building its campaign in Iraq and Syria, I was actually a journalism student. I was still in America. But I distinctly remember, as I think a lot of people around the world do, of being particularly disturbed by ISIS. And I think because at the time, because I was a journalism student, I remember thinking about how my experience with seeing and hearing that kind of terror had been primarily through secondhand sources, news reports, uh, usually from Western journalists, translated for my eyes and ears specifically. But ISIS was on YouTube, and they had a magazine, and their body count came with views, and I hadn't seen that before. And I remember as a kid hearing about news of al-Qaeda occasionally leaking a video of Osama bin Laden giving a speech, for example. But ISIS was different. ISIS were online influencers in their own right. And furthermore, they were effective. Thousands and thousands of young, dejected men from around the world found the philosophy and arguments espoused by this kind of communication strategy to be incredibly cogent. When we think of war, we think of the bloodshed and the territories seized and the refugees and IDPs that have to flee from their homes. And we're not wrong to think about those things. But these are all the results of war. Communication is actually where it begins. And this is a philosophy that Colonel Miles Kaggins III has had to embody. Colonel Kaggins III was the spokesman for Operation Inherent Resolve, which was the combined joint task force that included the help of 77 nations, including America and Kurdistan, to combat ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And his job was to destroy the Islamic State by using the same types of messaging tactics that made it grow so frighteningly rapid in the first place. And he gained a reputation, which he still very much has, of being a passionate advocate and enthusiast of Kurdish culture in particular. And he's kind of the perfect example of what happens when American military communication is used to bring the world together, which isn't something it necessarily has a reputation for. And equally importantly, he's one of the best people to talk to regarding the future of conflict in general. In an era where social media is weaponized and most objective information is both vast and readily available, and also because of that, more disturbingly up for debate than at any point in history, his is an important perspective to have. So with all that covered, here's what we talked about. Colonel Miles Kaggins, thank you so much for joining me today. Aaron, good to be with you. Rojvash to all your listeners there in Kurdistan and around the world. I wanted to start with your own background. Uh, could you take me quickly through your military background leading up to your responsibilities with the coalition? And specifically, I, I was wondering why you were selected as a, the spokesman for the coalition. Sure. Aaron, 26 years ago, uh, this month, May 2022, I was commissioned into the Army after completing my degree in history and the officer's training program at Hampton University in Virginia on the east coast of the United States. And began my career then. I started out for the first 10 years of my career focusing on military uh, logistics. And during that time, I was stationed around the world in Germany and Hanau and Heidelberg. I uh, spent some time in the Balkans and Albania and Macedonia. And then I departed Germany and headed to Fort Hood, Texas, where as a captain, I led a company of soldiers in the 4th Infantry Division. And we deployed to Iraq in in April 2003, and I served in the Diyala province uh, in a place called Muqtadiya, Mansuria, near the Hamrin Lake. And this was actually my first encounter with Kurdish people of any sort. There were some Peshmerga forces along the roads doing security guard as we pulled into the region in there in, in April, uh, at the end of April, after Saddam Hussein had fallen. My career, I was promoted up through the rank of colonel, and the opportunity to serve as spokesman for the coalition was part of my selection to serve as director of communications for the U.S. Army's Third Corps. The Third Corps is 
in charge of more than uh, nine coordinates activities for 90,000 U.S. troops. And the headquarters of the Third Corps uh, was swapping duties back and forth, leading the coalition in Baghdad. So it was our time to go again in August of 2019, and there I was, uh, positioned as the spokesman in Baghdad with responsibilities for the global coalition to defeat ISIS, which included more than 82 members at the time and the military operations in Iraq and Syria. So uh, when you were working alongside the KRG and, and the coalition, you actually gained a reputation uh, for integrating and, and very passionately with Kurdish culture. But I was just curious, um, c- could you tell me what you find so appealing about the area? Yeah, the, the coalition military headquarters was multinational and also included civilians. And there's a civilian uh, woman who's a friend of mine. Her name is Tanya Bahar Aziz. She's originally from Halabja area. She is Kurdish, and now she's Kurdish-American after the uh, massacre in Halabja and the chemical weapons attacks. She was able to immigrate to the United States and, and grew up became an adult, became a U.S. citizen, and has worked in various capacities for the U.S. government. And now she is still in Baghdad as the senior cultural advisor and strategy advisor for the coalition commanding general, bringing a local perspective to advise senior military officers. And I was one of them. And she said, hey, look, I want you to meet the Kurds. I want you to meet my people. I want you to understand the people in this region. And she encouraged me to get up to her bill and go up to her bill. And concurrently, I ran a Twitter account at the time uh, for the spokesman of the Operation Inherent Resolve. And I saw an opportunity to reach the the audiences who had been affected by ISIS. And that was my goal, the people who had been harmed by ISIS and the people who were doing the fighting against ISIS. And those were Arabs and Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan region and also the Syrian Democratic Forces in Syria. So obviously from a personal perspective, uh, you, you you did fall in love with the, the Kurdish culture, but I was wondering, how do you see that kind of cultural integration as fundamental to your work with the military? Yeah, the, I'd, I'd see myself mostly as a cross-cultural communicator who happens to be a colonel in the army and has had a variety of roles. And... People around the world have many, many things in common. People want to live in peace. People want to raise their families and uh, achieve their dreams, have as much prosperity as they can have, and live in an environment where they can give and receive love. And when I did this, I did not, I was not aware at the outset of my outreach how much impact this would have for people in the region. And I started to receive messages and Twitter and retweets, and sometimes uh, my WhatsApp would be shared, messages of thanks. Thanks from people from Halabsha through Hasaka all the way over to Afrin saying, thank you for tweeting in our language. Thank you for sending press releases in our language. Thank you for appearing on uh, Kurdish and Arab networks. Thank you for letting us know what the coalition is doing to help the Peshmerga and the SDF. And thank you for having the uh, the consideration to speak to us in our language, in our language that is oppressed or has been oppressed over time in Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, and Syria. It's actually interesting because <laughs> speaking personally, growing up, Uh, the generation that grew up with the Iraq war, I personally felt from a very young age that my government wasn't particularly forthcoming with the operations that were happening post-2003. I think a lot of people in my generation uh, feel that way. I don't think that's necessarily a problem with the military uh, as much as uh, with the elected officials that put them there in the first place. Uh, But I do feel like communication between American military forces and the societies it engages with have historically had a schism in communication. And there's plenty to point out uh, in Iraq where that was the case, I feel like. And I think there's a linguistic reason for that, uh, as you said. And obviously, there's some cultural ones as well. But I think your work as a spokesman represents a marked shift from that. And I was wondering, 
what change have you seen since the beginning of your service with regards to effectively engaging with other populations? And also, in your view, uh, what still needs to be improved upon? Yeah, the, the U.S. government can always improve upon how it's reaching out to communities across the world. And the first thing that needs to be done is the mindset, a mindset that says, I'm here as a guest and I don't have all the answers just because I'm an American. And once that mindset shift happens, then uh, government officials, government spokespeople from the United States will be willing to listen. And when communication requires both talking and listening, it is a process between the sender and the receiver that happens over and over again. It can't just be uh, speaking from on high and using talking points in the English language and uh, for spokespeople being happy to see our words in the Washington Post and overlooking the necessity to reach out to local press. So once that mind shift set shift happens, we see that there uh, can be success. I had some success there. Um, some of my successors uh, have had uh, varying degrees of continuing on those initiatives, uh, but it's waned certainly in recent months. Uh, and I've spoke to um, uh, current coalition communication staff and they have a, just a different approach toward uh, the region. They see that their, their approach is just to let the Partners do all the talking. So the Peshmerga does all the talking or SDF or Iraqi security forces. Uh, my counter argument to that is there's always a need for the coalition to explain how it's helping the partners. And explaining how it's helping the partners actually adds some protection, both physically and politically, as there are forces who want to push the American-led coalition out of Iraq in particular, and as well as, as Syria, uh, it's important that the coalition stays in touch with people. And uh, frankly, you have to get out of the office and compound at Baghdad and take it to the streets. Go out to the desert and do an interview in Northeast Syria, go into studio in Erbil and do an interview and maintain those touch points with the audience because the audience is who we're trying to reach. And the reporters, uh, press conferences, and media, social media are just conduits to reach the, the people. I think it will be imperative as uh, the U.S. continues to be engaged in the Middle East and if we continue to be engaged in Europe, that we see more street-level spokespeople, people there closer to the tip of the spear. Uh, right now in Europe, we see most of the explanation of, of government activities, of U.S. government activities and NATO activities comes from uh, senior, level, senior level spokespeople at the Pentagon or the White House. When there's a lot of activity happening in Europe that can be talked about by colonels and captains and sergeants who can explain what's happening there on the ground, how they're training and advising and equipping Ukrainian forces. Again, this sometimes the mindset shift has to happen all the way in the White House. Other times it has to happen at the local level with generals who frequently are accustomed to talking to media themselves. And sometimes are generals who are so skilled in, in fighting kinetic war or fighting combat war, they feel uh, skittish or reticent to talk to the media because something could go wrong. And instead of thinking about being concerned about the question might, that might come, government spokespeople or business leaders should think about the opportunity to reach audiences. You're from a military uh, family, correct? True. My father is a retired Army colonel. He's uh, also a veteran of the Vietnam War, where he did two tours. Do you ever talk with him about this, the, the divide in communication and how things have shifted, maybe even between generations? I mean, I'm talking about Iraq because that's my own experience growing up. But do you ever talk to him about even the, the schism in communication that happened, for example, in Vietnam? Yeah, uh, my mom and dad and I talk about these things regularly as they both follow what's happening in the news closely and they, they know that this is my uh, designated profession, my area of profession, my uh, area of expertise. And they also understand the generational shifts too. Even my own uh, parents, my mom in particular, sometimes she'd say, son, do you get nervous at the press conferences? What if somebody asks you a question and you, <laughs> you upset people in Washington? 
And I say, mom, you know, you, you, it's just different. People who are in my line of work and enjoy doing what we do, we're ready for those questions. We want those questions. We're trained for those questions and we're anticipating how to uh, give a legitimate and useful response to the question without getting crosswise with people politically or uh, upsetting our, our allies and partners. And there's also generational shifts here. Gen younger millennials, Gen Z, are accustomed to, to communicating on social media, but also accustomed to being hurt. It's more than just young people use Snapchat or young people use Instagram. It's when they're speaking on Instagram, they're accustomed to speaking out even to authority figures in ways that baby boomers and older generation X are, are typically told to be deferential and quiet until their opinion is asked for. Goes back to the approach I was talking about earlier, being audience centric. So you've got to go and talk to people. And, and one of the things is understanding beyond the specific goals of defeating ISIS and training and advising and equipping Peshmerga forces and SDF, understanding culture is what type of music do people like? What do people like to eat? How are people uh, dressing? What is the history of these groups? And taking an immersive approach, getting touch points, experiencing people as much as possible, and then adding that into a, an ongoing, continual conversation, including our time here this morning, Aaron. I wanted to actually jump back real quick to what you said about uh, the different forms of communication via social media, but also about the overall mindset of uh, how to communicate between generations. Uh, because your work as a spokesman for the coalition was based so much on public relations and quite the word I like to use, uh, but it is it was about competing with ISIS on the overall narrative concerning what kind of society Iraq and the Levant should embrace and why. Yes. And I was wondering if you could give me some examples of what kind of strategies you found effective against the Islamic State in that regard. Aaron, what I told my team when I arrived was that our goal was to dominate the information environment with weaponized truth. And we wanted to say things first and then have our adversaries, ISIS or these uh, Iranian-backed rogue militias, respond to what we were doing. So my first few weeks there, the uh, coalition and U.S. air power launched a massive uh, airstrike, a bombing run on Kynos Island near Mosul. And we plan to make a big rollout of this event in the, the media. We had press releases, infographics, statements in English and Arabic positioned. And we had strike video that was taken from drones and other jets and merged that video with video taken from the ground from Iraqi counterterrorism service commandos. And that video we spliced together. This is from September 2019. We published, and it was the most uh, popular video published by the Defense Department that year. And it gained international press because there were spectacular images. Now, a few months later, ISIS released a propaganda video. And a point of pride for me and my team is that in ISIS's propaganda video, they used clips of this bombing run, and it was like two ISIS guys in a cave and they were sending messages on Telegram saying, ah, it's okay, man, these bombs didn't hurt us. We're still here. We're going to make a comeback having this dialogue. <laughs> but just the fact that they had to incorporate our messages into their messages was a uh, proof point that we were being successful in leading the narrative. This happened later on, too, in a couple other circumstance instances when ISIS used our press releases to try to turn them into making a positive point for, for what they were doing. The counter violent extremism and narrative war, though, goes far beyond military operations. It, it's the coalition has four lines of effort, counter finance, uh, communication, 
uh, military line of effort, and then another line of effort related to um, the flow of people. And the communications group is working to influence people's minds and decisions related to joining ISIS and other extremist groups. And that, that happens all across the world in multiple languages. There's a entity called the Shawab Center in UAE at Abu Dhabi that you might be interested in learning more about. And they're producing content on social media that uh, presents an alternative way of life than choosing terrorist groups. Could you actually get into that a little bit? What kinds of strategies ISIS was specifically using with their own communications, for example, with recruitment, uh, as well as using information, their own sort of as you say, weaponized truth uh, as, as a form of combat in their day-to-day -day operations. It, let's look a little bit back at history. When ISIS came to prominence, one of the things that they did was effectively messaged. And the early leaders of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and uh, his colleagues, several of whom were with him at Camp Bukha, detained by U.S. forces in Iraq in uh, 2004, or five, six, they realized that they needed to have great content and have messages to reach across the world because they had global ambitions. ISIS uh, had members from more than 65 nations who joined, foreign terrorist fighters who flowed into the region. And they did that because of the effective branding, the well-produced videos, and uh, looked like a successful organization with a lofty mission to establish a caliphate. In March 23rd, 2019, was the Battle of Baghuz and the defeat of the physical territory of ISIS. But since then, ISIS continues to produce propaganda, its weekly newsletter out Naba, and, and in it, each Wali, each province of ISIS submits reports and statistics related to their, their attacks and activities. And they continue to operate on Telegram and try to uh, produce messages that pop up on more uh, mainstream public facing sites. Because of the work between governments in the coalition, as well as tech companies, now there are significant uh, algorithms and monitoring. So ISIS is not able to permeate its propaganda in Twitter and Facebook uh, and Snapchat and Instagram as easily as it did before. But prior to 2013, 2014, it was certainly the Wild West out there. And ISIS continues to uh, film its attacks to try to show success. And it, of course, wants to achieve its ambition of a worldwide uh, Muslim caliphate. You actually used the magic word, uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, <laughs> I think I became aware, like many Americans did, about the importance of recognizing uh, information as a weapon of war in the 2016 elections. And it's only become more prevalent uh, in the years since. Uh, but in a practical sense as well, uh, just for the, in the consciousness of people who are just on the, online every day, uh, it's, it's becoming such an important thing to recognize. And I wanted to ask about the strategies currently being implemented in, for example, uh, Russia and Ukraine. What do you recognize uh, in terms of tactics from either side with your own expertise and perspective? There's a few things that we see playing out in Ukraine in the information warfare front. Uh, first, there is, and going back to my mantra, which is dominate the information environment with weaponized truth. At the onset of the current attacks in Ukraine that began in February, we saw immediately on the Ukrainian side the activities of Russian. They played up any Russian attacks that were on civilian buildings. The leader, uh, President Zelensky, is a very public-facing person, and because he's an actor, he's grown up in front of cameras, he knows how to communicate with audiences. A lot of things have been written about and said that he's the greatest leader that the world has ever had. No, he actually just talks to people in the way that they receive information with his phone in his hand on a selfie as he's walking the street. He's wearing a t-shirt like most people wear when they're talking, uh, Aaron, and this connects and resonates with audiences. And he did this to 
raise awareness, and he's on a relentless campaign to raise awareness and galvanize international support for Ukraine versus the bear. Russia has used, as it normally does, uh, disinformation. So taking some kernels of truth and then making them out to be much bigger than they are. They continue, Russia continues to push this narrative that they're fighting all these Nazis in Ukraine. Uh, they continue to downplay any incidents that have harmed civilians, uh, and they they continue to either inflate their success or or explain away why they have not had as much progress as the world is expected. This will continue to play out for many weeks and, <clears throat> and months ahead. And the rest of the world can learn and observe uh, from these, these Western competitors in conflict and incorporate the things that have been done there. One thing new for the United States has been the de quick declassification, the rapid declassification of intelligence information and sharing that publicly. Again, dominating the information environment with weaponized truth. There's a culture within intelligence services in the United States and other nations to hoard and hold information that only a few people know about. Uh, but that information itself is powerful, and sharing it is something that can really change the shape of how activities happen on the battlefield. And culturally, it's important for American leaders to recognize that sharing information that's classified classified at what we call the five eyes, English speaking nations, misses an opportunity to share important information to the rest of the world. That comes out though of, uh, we talked about cross-cultural communication, but frankly, Americans, Brits, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians, they have a view that's ethnocentric. So they couldn't dare think about sharing classified information with Ukrainians. Italians, you can't trust those people. But that is shifting with this combat that's happening in Ukraine, and the intelligence community is working actively to open up the amount of information it shares with our partners and allies. To wrap it up, uh, what kind of strategies do you see it in communication and conflict becoming more prevalent in the future? I think we are already in a continual state of conflict in the information space, a uh, little bit in the physical space, but in information and in space and in outer space, this competition and conflict, even warfare is happening now and will continue to go on and on and on. The things that happen on the ground, things that are seen and recorded on TikTok are now able to influence policy decisions. Make no doubt about it, the reason that the United States is pumping billions of dollars of aid into Ukraine is because of the images that have come out of Ukraine and because of the pleas of President Zelensky, because of the stories of human migration. This is going to continue to happen over time where street level reporters, citizen reporters, Average everyday people are going to capture images that will be compelling and connect emotionally with audiences, with government leaders that will lead toward policy changes and action that will influence outcomes on the battlefield all around the world. Well, Colonel Miles Kagan is the third. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Aaron, thanks for your time. And I uh, am thankful to all the Kurdish people who welcome me as a friend and brother. And we're going to continue our friendship over time. I'll be retiring from the Army in November and looking forward to traveling back to the region as soon as I can and visiting the Zagros Mountain hiking trail. Well, you enjoy that, and hopefully we'll see you here. All right. Good seeing you. Whole hafiz. Whole hafiz. Thanks once again to Colonel Miles Kaggins III for a very interesting conversation. And thank you, our listeners, for giving us your time 
Inside Kurdistan is brought to you by the Kurdistan Information Network. If you'd like to check out our website, it's in the description below. We are at kurdistanin.net. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast or any of our other material, you can reach out to us at info at kurdistanin.net. That's our episode. Thanks once again. I've been Aaron Weintraub, and this has been Inside Kurdistan. Inside Kurdistan.